So hello everybody and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third event of the Royal Academy of Engineering's CAFE Connecting Awardees Fostering Engagement series. I'm Professor Karen Holford, I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Cardiff University, I'm Chair of the Royal Academy of Engineering's Research Committee and I will be the Chair for this morning's session. Uh, this Academy Cafe series is a single part of the ongoing support for current and previous awardees and we hope to build this activity further. The series will cover a broad range of topics and the discussion here will feed into the Academy's policy work. This is the third in the series and we are delighted to welcome you to our discussion on real-time optimization for mission critical applications today. We'll begin with a brief introduction and conversation with our guest speaker, followed by an opportunity for you to pose questions. We ask you that you follow the normal um, Zoom meeting etiquette, which is up there now, the housekeeping. So switch off your mobile phone and laptop notifications to do not disturb and make sure you're in a quiet space. Um, I'd also like you to note that we're recording the main event session and it may be published on the Royal Academy of Engineering website. During the Q&A session, please do um, switch your cameras on so that we can see you and get you to engage directly with our, our speaker. And throughout the event, please submit your questions by simply clicking on the chat feature located towards the bottom of your screen and type your question into the open field. Um, alternatively, if you want to verbally ask your question, please click on participant located towards the bottom of the screen and select raise hand. This is the um, famous blue hands and I'll try and keep an eye on that and see whether I can bring people into the conversation. We'll also try and, and answer as many as your questions. So wireless communications and associated digital technologies have been shaping our planet in an unprecedented way, not least in the current battle against COVID-19. But increasingly, generally, we live in an interconnected, smart, globalised society in which physical and information worlds are inextricably linked. Global mobile data traffic is increasing exponentially and it is, it is expected that there will be a hundred billion Internet of Things devices by the year 2025. And that's truly amazing, isn't it? Thus the need for optimization for wireless networks. The research techniques developed to address this problem can also be applied to many other fields, including where time is a critical factor, such as for rescue teams and emergency services, and also more broadly to everything from the environment to policy making and smart cities. So with that background information, I'm delighted to introduce you to today's speaker, who is Professor Trung Dong. Trung is Nokia Bell Labs Royal Academy of Engineering Research Chair at Queen's University Belfast. Welcome Trung. His current research interests include wireless communications, machine learning, real-time optimization, big data and Internet of Things enabled applications for disaster management, air quality monitoring, flood monitoring, smart agriculture, healthcare and smart cities. Wow, such a lot that you're covering there Trung. So to start the conversation, Trung, I noticed, and welcome, and, and I'm so pleased to, to have this opportunity to talk to you today. Now, I noticed in your press release for your research chair that you said you'd come a long way from being a child in Vietnam playing with walkie-talkies to where you are now. So could you please start by telling me a little bit about this and ha perhaps how it motivated you to work on wireless communications? Yeah, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Karen, for the very nice introduction. Um, so, uh, as you can see from my press release, uh, I had uh, told you um, that I, I come a long way from uh, playing walkie walkie like a child. So, you know, I, I will grow up, I was born in a small town in Vietnam named Hoi An Town, and this is about um, in uh, 16th, 17th century. So, it's a UNESCO World Heritage. So, it's very beautiful. So, if you've been you have a chance to come to go to Vietnam, I strongly recommend you to go to uh, Hoi An, it's the first destination. But actually, I strongly discourage you to go in the time in October or early November, because there's a lot of uh, a lot of storm, you know, natural disaster, flooding, hurricane happening in, in my in my region, my local uh, province. And when I was a child, we always had the flood and storm in November uh, and October. So we just stayed at home and we, uh, we couldn't play together at the uh, young children, we couldn't play together and we talk each other from, uh, you know, how to how and cross the road using the walkie talkie. 
And as a child, when when we we know that we had some uh, flooding or storm, we, we we don't have to go. We didn't have to go to school, and all the children is very happy. But then, you know, when when I saw a lot of uh, sad story, one of uh, some of my friend relatives, they had uh, the friend or they have a loved one died because of the disaster, and it's really um, giving me some inspiration and motivation how to do something when I grow up to help my my local uh, community, and that is one of the. The, the giving me some up kind of um, motivation to start the discovery so thank you that's a truly inspirational story and I, I can just picture you playing with your friends on your walkie talkies uh, <laughs> you know out of school when school's not happening that's great yeah. so in terms of real-time optimization what are the main drivers for that optimization in current applications and, and why are you particularly focusing on this so be, before I answer directly to your question, I, I want to uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, what is the current wireless communication technology at the moment. So we, we have a lot about 5G at the moment. It's the one of the big deal. A lot of uh, discussion about 5G and, and, and beyond 5G. And you know, uh, it's very uh, coincidentally that every 10 year, we had a new generation of the mobile wireless communication. So we had the 3G, we had the 4G, and now we have the 5G technology. And Combined with the previous technologies, every new generation, they, they, they increase the capacity or data rate and increase the, the coverage. However, uh, compared with uh, other 3G and 4G, 5G is depart from that. It's more than just a higher capacity or higher data rate. So let's take a look up uh, if we want to download a, a two hour movie using 3G, it's going to take you one hour. If you use 4G, it's going to take you one minute, but 5G, just one second, one click of your mouse, you can fully download the video into your, uh, your, your devices. And for 5G, besides increasing the data rate or capacity, we has two other uh, services, or we can say a new development of the 5G. One is a mission critical communication. When I say mission critical communication, we can talk a whole bunch of important uh, application like emergencies, autonomous system, smart intelligence transport system, a lot of things. And this kind of uh, mission critical communication that require two important target. This is one is very small delays. We talk about millisecond delays. And another thing is ultra reliability. It means when you send a billion of packets, we only allow to have just one packet errors, almost 100% uh, correctly received. And that, and another thing you already mentioned in your introduction that we're going to have 100 billion internet IoT devices. So by the year 2025, each citizen in the world going to have around 10 uh, IoT devices that connected together. And those are going to pose a huge challenge for the network uh, provider. So you know that optimization is central of everything uh, for optimal decision making from engineering to economic to societies. And you know, for wireless communication, 5G and beyond, normally for optimization, it's gonna take us around two, sec two seconds, two minutes, even longer than that. And for some miss mission critical communication service I just mentioned, we cannot wait that long. We need to have something more response time in the real time. And it can be lead to a millisecond and even microsecond. And that is uh, one of uh, the driving force of my, my research for retail optimization. Yeah, and you talked about natural disasters in Vietnam and, and various places. And I guess that's, um, you know, it's really critical where time is critical, you know, for rescue teams and perhaps in areas of flooding or, or, or earthquakes or natural disasters. And this is, you know, this is where the application is really time critical, isn't it? Can you expand a little yeah. bit on that? So um, you, you can see it for, for natural disaster, for emergency. Uh, the first 70 hours is very important. We need to locate people. We need to find where is the victim. We need to evacuate them. Even uh, we cannot provide uh, evacuate them. We have to provide food, uh, medical supply, and things like that. And normally when disaster happens, it happens some in isolated area, a rural area, especially in developing country where we don't have really the network infrastructure ready like in the Western uh, new country. And also even it's happened in, 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 in Europe or North America still, when disaster happened, you can see huge storm, it can destroy everything. We don't have uh, fiscal uh, power supply, the network the telecommunication also devastated. And, and that is very hard to maintain communication 
uh, to to get uh, to know people where they, they and it's also very hard to communicate. And in this scenario, you can see that a lot of people want to connect together. You have friend, you have relative in those areas. You don't want to call them, and the network congestion even higher than normal time. So it's more like uh, getting the situation harder and harder. So thinking about that is uh, really a, a, one of the biggest challenges uh, for for the, the research in the field. And one of the solution you can you can see that in. We can use some kind of unmanned area vehicle. We create a UAV network that fly in the top of the area, become uh, like flying base station. It can like operate as like a new um, base station. You can say connect the, the victim in the disaster area with the, the, the safe area so that we can have the, the connectivity uh, provide and we can we can communicate with the, the people and we know where they are and and for for U, UAV. Um, the, the problem is the, 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 the battery and the flying type UV is very limited. And you want to, to maintain um, the UV as long as possible. You have to optimize the trajectory of the UAV, how to use the smaller number of UV as, as small as possible, how to optimize the result is very important. And, and when UAV become the flying base station, they consume even more power then because you had to send the signal from one place to another. You had to take the camera, you had to take the video and send it to the base station. And that is a lot of you know, energy consumption. So how to optimize these things is very important. Yeah, the optimization I can see there is absolutely critical, but also the need to work with multidisciplinary teams as well to provide you know, an all round solution to, to each particular problem. That's great. So what about broader applications, Trang? How can, have you got any examples of some broader applications and how they benefit as well from optimization? There are many other, um, other uh, application you can see whenever we need to optimize something and they, they need to do quickly, uh, uh, we need to have the uh, the real time optimization. We, we can see in, in autonomous system, right? So we have, let's say, in that 10 years, we have autonomous car, uh, autonomous system in the, in the, on the road, and all this can need to communicate each other. And every small delay in the car communication called the big trouble, especially. Mm -hmm. You know, in the highway, you have a high traffic car moving, you cannot have delay and it can cause serious, you know, you know traffic accident. Uh, it's one example. Even for, 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 um, for example, in, in recently, we can see that um, in a COVID-19 situation where we have a lot of um, force and uh, uh, regulation has been displayed to, to, to maintain social distancing and some country like, uh, like Ch Korea, China, even uh, Germany, Instead of using the policeman because you, you don't want to 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 put the hair of the officer at risk, you, we can use drone to to announce the, um, the regulation from the government, or we can disperse crowd. And also, when the COVID happened in China, the government also used the UIV to test or deliver medicine, or or they can uh, provide some kind of um, you know um, food and things like that for for isolated patient and and drone. Uh, I think it's very important and using real time automation when drawn the changing environment, we can have the, the, the very quick response time and we can optimize the number of drones. You can, you can use a thousand or, or, or 10,000 drones because it's so, so, so expensive. So that is, uh, I think, the important application that we can, we can discuss. Yeah, and I guess, you know, the more you think about it, the more applications there are. You know, there's so many applications that can benefit from this, aren't there? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for that explanation. That's great. So. I suppose with every research project, um, every research project that I've ever worked on, um, you come across barriers. And as engineers, you know, we are used to solving um, problems and overcoming barriers. So what do you think, what in your opinion are the key barriers with real-time optimization and how have you overcome them or how do you plan to overcome them in the future? So um, the, the barrier, the most barrier for automation, you can look from different angles, first from the user. When we when talk about user, customer who, who doesn't have really uh, a strong background of optimization. They don't know anything. They have problem there, and they want to optimize their problem. They have objective function. They have constraint, and they just want to optimize. And when they pro provide the information, actually, in order to run real time optimization, in technically, you need to have convex uh, problem. But those practical optimization is not convex, and the, the user, or customer, they don't know that. So when they provide, then we need to provide them immediate solution, and that is one of the challenging. So. From, from the research uh, point of view, we have the large scale optimization problem. It means when I talk large scale, I mean we have a thousand, 10,000 of variable in optimization problem. Uh, we, I mentioned about 100 billion internet and connected device, you can see. 
So when we have uh, a higher number of the uh, variable, normally the optimization problem, they're not just linearly uh, increase, they expand exponentially increase. So the computational expense is so, so high. So that is one of the other challenges yeah. of the, um, the retail optimization. Yeah, thanks, Trang. I can see that. Yeah. And so I, I can imagine that researchers who are kind of major in other fields might um, want to apply real time optimization to their own research. So where where should we start? You know, where, 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 where's the best place to start and what should people in other fields be aware of when they're attempting um, you know, to, to utilize real time optimization techniques? Yeah. So um, now that we have a lot of new technology that can support us, like we have cloud computing, we have the very big uh, high performance computing devices that can run a lot of uh, computational in, in very short time. And uh, we don't really um, worry much about that. The thing is we need to convert the problem, as I mentioned earlier, that transform the problem into the problem, uh, in other words, convert problem, problem that we can give the machine to have. So we have a lot of programming, uh, a software, or you can say back it like Civic Python, Civic MATLAB, Civic R, and things like that. And and how to use this software is important. So basically, uh, real-time optimization is optimization. So we need to know basically optimization, and then at the convex problem, convex optimization problem. But convex optimization problem not really straightforward. You can apply this the uh, the tool or software. So you need to know some more transform technology some technique like distributed uh, computing or parallel computing, even some uh, basic understanding of transformation of optimization into the, the, the real, 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 world, real world. And, and uh, nowadays, uh, sorry, uh, nowadays we, we, in order to overcome that, we are writing a book in uh, real-time optimization, uh, which will be published early next year by IET. This is the topic in real-time optimization for 5G network and the uh, industrial internet of things. So we, we basically provide very fundamental understanding for, for, for personnel and researcher in the field, how to get familiar with this topic. Um, yeah. Oh, brilliant, Trang. That, that, that'll be amazing. I'll look forward to, to seeing that published okay. because um, I think when, when anybody starts looking at something new, you, know, you always need a, a basic book to inform you, don't you? And then, um, you know, perhaps the, the technique of, um, or, or the, method of getting some PhD students to help you is often a good thing and referring them to start uh, you know with the book as a starting place yeah. so that's great so thank you so I'm 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 nearly out of questions now so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to the audience I can see we've got around about 30 people in the audience and I'm sure they're absolutely bursting with questions so I'm going to look for the blue hands there's no blue hands up yet so please do Put your hand up and speak your, and turn your camera on if you want to come in. Don't be shy. Um, this is a cafe, so um, we're all relaxed here. So I'm reaching out to all of you to put your hand up. While you're thinking about your question, or even type it in as a message and I'll ask it to Trung. So while you're all thinking about your questions, um, I want to ask another one, which is of personal interest to me, Trung, as the chair of the research committee. And I'd like to ask you, um, how much has the Royal Academy of Engineering Research Chair meant to you, and what does it what has it done? What has it enabled you to do that you wouldn't have otherwise done? Well, um, I really um, I, I was very happy when I, I received the um, the the research chair award because it's going to be uh, a huge um, I can say so important for my for, for my research. It's giving me a lot of uh, support from the Royal Academy. I can see that because I was. I am the uh, the Royal Academy Research Fellowship. Uh, five years ago, I was awarded the Royal Academy Research Fellowship, and I still holding that until the end of this year. So I understand how important it is for for um, a, a academic researcher to get the uh, the support from the Royal Academy. It's not just uh, financial support, also mental support. This kind of activity, like uh, academic cafe, give me opportunity to uh, you know engage with the audience and I can learn a lot of from this kind of discussion so that I can improve my research. So it's so, so important and I'm very happy about that. Yeah, I mean, it really is helpful, isn't it? And I think the, the whole scheme, the fellowship and the chairs and all of the different schemes we've got, you know, there's a suite of schemes, isn't there, that people can apply for. It's great when people apply for one and then towards the end of it are successful in another because it means that, you know, you've got ongoing support from the academy for your really important work. And the work seems so important and vital that I'm not surprised that the academy has chosen to support you in that area. So, you know, thank you very much, Trung, for your continued work. 
Now I'm 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 looking. There's nobody switched their camera on yet and and put their blue hand up. Um, but I can see quite a few questions coming in, so perhaps people prefer me to ask them. So we've got a question from um, uh, Huda, which is, what are the health risks of 5G technology? So we have heard some popular press uh, reports about health risks. So could you perhaps um, explain any risks that you see to us? Yeah, I, I, I can surely guarantee that there's no health risk for 5G technology. You know, during, during the COVID in, in the UK, we see several uh, untrue story about uh, maybe the, the COVID stuff from 5G, but it's absolutely it's untrue because the 5G technology is normally from electromagnetic fields, nothing related to biology or human. So I can confirm that. The, the, regarding the high risk of 5G technology, I can say it's no high risk. The reason is for, for, for 5G technology or mobile communication technology in general, we, for example, even the biggest, um, a transmitter is a base station. They use very small power, about few watt, three or four or five watt. It's so so small. It has no impact on the health issue. And that is, uh, I can guarantee that is no no health issue for 5G technology. Because even for 5G, we want to do a lot of energy efficiency. Even we want to reduce the transmit power from base station. We don't want to waste the power. So even we have lower power. So the health risk even you know have no concern at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Trung, thank you for that reassurance. And then yeah. the next question from um, Susan Gavenek is, can you talk a little bit about the methodologies that you use for achieving the necessary efficiency for real-time optimization, and where are the areas for improvement or areas for further research? And that's really interesting for people looking to get into the area to, you know, where are the places where the research can make a difference? Yeah. So uh, one, the key issues of the real-time optimization is you can use the uh, available uh, programming toolbox to, to solve the problem in quickly uh, as, as soon as possible. And those are, as I mentioned earlier, uh, service by tone, service my lab. So you, you can, you, it's a, a free, it's available uh, free. So you can use just open source code, that's one thing. However, you know, to use a problem into your real, uh, real time or practical uh, problem is not easy because your, prop, your practical problem, optimization problem might not be uh, directly applicable. So you need to start from scratch. You need to build up the optimization problem. You need to transform the optimization problem into the problem that you can use the toolbox. That's one thing. So there's a lot of a whole technique, a lot of book uh, on those things. And nowadays, when we talk about large scale system, uh, we, we can use some of very strong uh, computational devices uh, like uh, uh, cloud computing, uh, big server to show them. Uh, and, and again, as, as I mentioned, using cloud computing for real-time application, first of all, you want to uh, fly a, a number of drones on the field of, uh, like in the rice field, you want to collect the information. Even the transmit information from your field back to the cloud computing takes around 200 milliseconds, already longer than the optimization problem running. So you need to not using those centralized computing, you have to use maybe distributed computing like for computing or even as computing. So remember for large scale optimization, the complexity increase exponentially with the number of variables. So we have, for example, 1000 variable, instead of using 1000, we can distribute it to 10 or 10, well, even 50. It can really significantly reduce the time of your complexity and computational time. So it's very important. Yeah, thank you, Trung. And there's a qu another question from Roy that's not unconnected to that question. So it's about systems today relying on greater in interconnectivity and becoming systems of systems. So how can you optimize across systems of systems where you haven't got an overall controlling system? Uh, let me check. We, um, I think that I I um I might I might answer partly uh, this question in uh, in previous uh, question uh, instead of we use a centralized approach, uh, we can use uh, the distributed approach like uh, for example now even each drone we can install the warp ball on that and the warp ball is quite quite cheap uh, well maybe for 30, 40 baht even you have expensive warp ball to three hundred a uh, thousand baht they can do very strong computational. Uh, on, on the work ball. So instead of put everything into your cloud or your centralized device, you can you then you can do individual. So now instead of uh, maximize in the central station, we can we can put the burden from that centralized uh, calculation put to the uh, the drone or smaller device, and we can do it without controlling on the overhead, and it's really very really quick. 
Yeah, I see. So it's about protocol, um, isn't it? Yeah. So you don't yeah. need an, an overall con control. It's a yeah. protocol throughout the whole system and throughout yeah. the whole... Yeah, we yeah, I understand. Thank you for that. Um, right, I'm just looking again to see whether we've got any hands up. Um, I can see a blue hand up now. Um, so Faith, would you like to um, ask your question, please? And can you turn your camera on to ask it? Faith Karugalu, you've got the hand up. Brilliant, Faith, I can see you. Uh, can you turn your microphone on? Oh, sorry. Welcome. Okay. Yeah, what's your question? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, Tarun, how are you? Hi, for this long time now, see. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are all friends. Uh, uh, Chung, uh, you know that uh, one of the concerns in 5G networks is a uh, security. So I am in the security side of the problem. Uh, what do you think about uh, your work in optimization uh, related to security? Uh, your work is separated from the security concerns, uh, you know, relying on uh, the security services or uh, should you think about security when you develop optimization algorithms? That is really, really very good question. Uh, when we talk about 5G, one of the critical concerns is the security. I think with the utmost concern is uh, security. And um, for, for security, when we talk about security, normally we talk about the uh, traditional cryptography or encryption. And nowadays, this one of the, the another uh, maybe the new research in the security, we call it physical layer security. So we, we can add another layer of security on top of that. So it might be like you, you can lock the door twice. One, one, one lock is encryption, another lock is uh, physical layer security, uh, security. When I talk physical layer security, it means I, I talk about the physical um, meaning of the wireless channel. So now, because now I'm talking to everyone in the room, we only see the message. It means oh, my message is absolutely uh, not secure, right? So if we have some hacker bad guy coming in the room, they, they know what we are talking. And if we say something important, they, they know. And physical layer, it means everything we talk broadcast outside the wireless channel will be heard by everyone. And some bad people, bad, uh, they're gonna hack into the system and they know. So this is one of the disadvantage of the wireless on 5G network. But we can use the physical nature of the wireless become Turn, turn around the disadvantage become advantage. And that's because physical layer security. So we, instead of send the signal all over from one place to uh, another. So I talked to Farid now, instead of send on signal, my energy to you, I can send maybe parts of my a signal to you, but I use another power of my signal to jam some guy who, who want to interfere us and how to optimize my power or my energy efficiency in this scenario is one of my, I think very critical uh, research because one time I want one thing I want to send my message reliable to you another thing I want to jam this guy as as, soon, as as much as possible right but I have limited power I cannot do everything so how to optimize that is one of the critical the critical things for 5G as well so I think this is uh, you can talk about optimization and security in this kind of perspective the very match together yeah, thank you, Trung. I can see Faith nodding, so I'm sure you've answered his question. Um, so we've got another question around, um, I guess, sort of, um, you know, the security of the system, really, not not in terms of um, uh, in terms of redundancy and backup. So it's a question from Daniel. It's just disappeared. So I'm trying to get it back. Yeah. So since we increasingly rely on mobile networks um, and um, we're really lost without them, you know, we all know the panic when our network goes down when we're due to host a Zoom meeting. So um, are there any redundancy and backups in place in terms of, you know, making sure that service is, is, is constant? Oh, I think... Um... I think we, we normally the backup would be in, in the in the in the cloud in the we have we have well, so I said you, when you open your computer now and you say something you can say in your device in your mobile phone but normally you can say into the cloud and I think cloud is one of uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the 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 most suitable thing to to back up the plan but I think go back to security uh, question of uh, this, I think for for cloud it's really as in critical because if they had the problem in security in cloud, everything gone. So nowadays for 5G, not only cloud computing, we have our fault computing. So we distributed our resources, our data around the world. So first of all, if you want to, to, to hide 
or to rent some uh, storage or cloud. And when you, you, you order on the internet, you can see that they provide you not only the central uh, cloud computing, but they also provide some location cloud to you so that you can have such certain amount of backup uh, in terms of the network and your data. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to the last question because it's connected with this one. So question from Susan. Do you think that data trust is appropriately correlated with data security? Or do you think people are too trusting or perhaps are they too untrusting? There's a human behavior question, I guess, but what are your yeah. thoughts on that? I think it might be in, in between, uh, between the, the, the trusting and untrusting. Uh, uh, I'm not really the expert in, in, in securities, uh, but my, my, my research is uh, in, in uh, is no processing, but I think the, the 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 security you have to be. Uh, it's more like game theory for me. It's more like between trusting or and completely trusting and completely untrusting. So I think it's game theory. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And it yeah. just goes to show that you know we need we do need multidisciplinary researchers applying themselves to these questions. Yeah, um, and it is more a, a social science and and a predictive question, isn't it? Um, right, okay, so this is a, a technical question on, on um, novel signaling schemes from Nidhi. So the question is, will you be applying any novel si signaling schemes to cope with interference to achieve low latency? And if you are, then um, have you got any examples? This is definitely um, an excellent question, actually. Uh, for, for low latency, actually, signaling is very important because uh, it, they were not the, the most... Um, the more traditional and oldest uh, problem of the wireless 5G or network is the, the, the interference. So we can see, even in Zoom, you can see that when someone turn on their speaker, even they don't talk, they still have noise, background noise, and they really interfere us. So for, for wireless network, imagine we had thousands of users talk together, they're gonna interfere. And now we have internet devices, we have 10,000 of devices connect to the same hotspot to get, uh, at the same time. It's gonna cause the hue problem for, for, for the network. And because of the, 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 the interference, the latency or the delay will be, will be challenging and will be affected. So before we do our low latency optimization, we had to do signaling scheme for signal. And one of the, the research we are looking at at the moment is uh, improper Gaussian signaling. It means we don't assume the signal Gaussian perfect Gaussian. We had to assume that we had to take into account that they are not perfect and it requires some signal processing uh, in, 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 in the early stage before we do optimization. So I can, I can recommend some of the uh, technique at the moment, like IBS or improper Gaussian signaling. Yeah, thank you, Trang, that's really helpful. Um, okay, so we've got another question specific to your research from Victor um, Becerra. Victor would like to know, how do you deal with the case when your real-time optimization algorithm does not converge in time? That's an excellent question. It's happening all the time, even for me at the moment. I, when I run uh, my uh, my simulation with my research, uh, or even in, in some of our demonstration, it's not convert. And that is that we had to work on. Uh, that's me. I mean, when we we had the problem, we had a lot of um, the uh, the technique to transform the original problem to sub problem that can help with conversion time. So maybe uh, we had to be trade off between the performance and the running time of the optimization. So sometimes we want we, we cannot get the perfect uh, result, maybe 100% not perfect, but we might get like 90%, 95%, but it can reduce the complexity, it can get our optimization algorithm to convert. And that is actually happening in, in real life. You have to, we have to be trade-off uh, between the performance and, and the complexity. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. That's helpful. And yeah, we all, no, nothing's ever perfect, is it? No, nothing. <laughs> That's the nature of research. You have to work hard to overcome those problems. Right, okay, there's no more questions on the list and there's no more question, no more hands up. Um, I, I'm, just while we see whether anybody else, because quite often I find on these that people think of the questions or, or um, you know, get the courage to ask the question right at the end. So we'll give participants a few more minutes to think up some more questions or put their hands up and get courage. But just while we wait for that trend and um, you know you, you were a previous fellowship holder and, and then you went on to have a research chair and I'm really interested in um, you know perhaps we've got people who are fellowship holders on the call at the moment and what would be your advice to them to uh, you know make a great application for the chair so transitioning from that fellowship to a chair you know what do you think are the best approaches and and, and how have you been successful um 
because it's cafe, so I can truly tell you the truth. So whenever you receive the uh, the uh, award from the Royal Academy, first my award in Royal Academy Research Fellowship, uh, you have to forget it the day after. <laughs> just, I mean, just, uh, uh, I mean, what I mean is um, you, you have to think about ahead of your research. Don't think this fellowship is going to hold your career, going to secure your career for the next five years. Think of it at the opportunity to give you more time to think what's going on in the next five, 10 years, uh, or even longer than that. And, and that when I got my uh, fellowship, actually more than five years ago in 2015, I would think that because that time I proposed a scheme for, for, for small cell security, physical layer security of, of um, 5G network. And what I want to do at that time to increase the data rate uh, of, the, of the, the network, but beyond increasing the data rate, I had to think further ahead, like mission critical or massive number of internet, uh, internet of things devices. So I think um, thinking ahead uh, beyond uh, your, 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 your current you know, research at the, at the moment is very important, especially when we have uh, the British Church of World Wide Rather Academy Research Fellowship give us a, a, lot, a lot of opportunity uh, to, to think and, and doing uh, more wider uh, impact research. Yeah, Tran, I'm really grateful for your honesty there because that's exactly the right um, response, isn't it? Because, um, you know, just getting getting a, a grant or getting a, a, you know, your research funded is, it gives you the gift of time. That's what it gives you. It's the gift of time to think about your research and develop it further. And it's not about, it's not like applying for a job and then doing that job. And then when the job comes to an end, applying for another job, is it? It's really about developing your research ideas, working through your research ideas, and then picking on the ones that are going to be most successful and then working those up for, for future, um, you know, support and, you know, generating ideas is what we do as researchers. So that's really good advice um, to those out there on the cafe who are at the fellowship stage at the moment. So thank you, Trent, for your honesty there. Um, and actually somebody's just asked that exact question as well. So your successful experience in, in securing a fellowship, a professorship. So yeah, so you, you were awarded a professor by your university, um, you know, as well, weren't you? So um, any thoughts about, about transitioning from, um, you know, transitioning to a professor in your university? Um, I, I applied for uh, the internal uh, promotion uh, in January this year, and I got the decision in, in, in June, uh, promoted to professor, of course, very happy. So after four years, after exactly four and a half years of my uh, Royal Academy Research Fellowship, I, I received a uh, promoted to professor. Uh, I don't. I don't really have any more like uh, the advice or. or um, um, I think the most important thing is uh, you have to to enjoy what you're doing, and I really don't even think about uh, you know promotion to professor. Uh, but because when I saw the uh, you know when my career, I still I, I received my PhD like I think around seven years ago. It's not really that long, uh, so I think just. Um, for my experience, just doing doing your work, keep doing your work, uh, enjoy doing your work. I think it's pay off. So when you have uh, your uh, some kind of uh, good result, the university and your colleague will recognize. It. And and actually, my when I write my uh, promotion application, the motivation in front of one of the uh, the um, senior colleague in my school, when he came to knock to my door, said, "Don't." I, he suggested me to to apply for this year, and actually, it's, I didn't have any uh, you know talk to apply in the beginning, but because of some kind of motivation from colleague and people recognize my work and they think that I deserve and to apply, so I just go for it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really good advice, and I think you know absolutely I agree with you. If you're enjoying your work and you're working, you know, you're working on what you enjoy, that's the best. You know, it's such a privilege, isn't it, to be able to work on things we enjoy and to be able to do our research. And if you work hard, you know, the rewards in terms of um, progression will come, won't they? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I quite often question people who want to map out their career in terms of, you know, when am I going to get the next promotion? Because actually life doesn't work like that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, when you are enjoying your work, you will be exactly. successful. And when you are successful, you will be recognised. So, you know, there's a combination. I also think it needs, people do need encouraging. You know, you've said that you were encouraged to apply for a promotion 
promotion you wouldn't have applied otherwise yeah. and I've always been in that same position myself it's always taken somebody to encourage me so I think if there's any senior people on the call here you know I would urge you to encourage young talent to or talent to apply for promotion because sometimes um, people don't put themselves forward um, exactly. The ones who really deserve it don't may not put themselves forward. Anyway, we're going off on a philosophical <laughs> um, chat here. But Trang, it's been absolutely, it's been a delight for me to talk to you and to find out more about your research and, and your life. Oh, I've got another blue hand up. So we have got time. Um, Chung Ching Kao, Ka, Kao um, you've got a, your hand up so, and your camera is on. So would you like, and you're, and you're unmuted. So would you like okay, to answer? Ask your question, please, John. Okay, I'll just ask some non-technical question. I'm the program manager at Academy, and I have attended Trong's uh, mental meeting several times. Um, my observation, he had very good working relationship with working relationship with his ING mentor. So I know with all uh, participants, all so our awardee, I just wonder whether Trong can share how you form the working relationship with mm -hmm. your ING mentor. Mm. Uh, any some tips or some experience you can share with other awardee? Yeah, so uh, that is very, uh, I forgot that, Jung Ching, so thank you for reminding me. So I have a very uh, can say a strong or special relationship with my mentor, Professor Ala Chot Hanzo at Southampton University. So I first know him by email him that whether he can be my mentor. I didn't know him before. I just know him when when the Royal Academy asked me to nominate one of my mentors, and I, I I found him that he's one close to my research. And over the last uh, five six year, we 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 I can say I can pick up at the phone to call him anytime I want to. And on of his advice, uh, even um, some years ago when I had some other opportunity to to have some kind of uh, uh, you know uh, some kind of new opportunity moving other places and he strongly recommend me um, some very good advice and I think it's so so much payoff and talking to these uh, people like senior colleagues and mentor not only helpful and technical but also uh, so so an invaluable suggestion and advice from from the uh, the college who who know thing and who know the field and know everything in the academy is so grateful and I strongly recommend on the awardee uh, from the Royal Academy Research Fellowship instead of uh, email or meet your, your mentor once or, or two per year. Don't hesitate, or hesitate to pick up the phone, talk to them, even have a chat regularly, you know, once every two weeks or, or month, chat everything, maybe something, some opportunity will come up. And that is, I think you're gonna have, you have a really grateful for that. Yeah. Chun Ching, that was such a good question, and thank you for mentioning mentors because that is one of the um, you know key things about this scheme is that that every the people on the scheme get mentors, and um, you know as a mentor myself, I I think that I would say as a mentor you learn just as much from your mentee as they learn from you, and it is a it is an important relationship, and you need to you need to build that relationship, don't you, and that trust, and you know the ability that Trung has said that he can pick up the phone anytime to his mentor and get that feedback is just really valuable to anybody. Everybody needs people to bounce ideas off, don't they? And Lucy's just noted that it's National Mentor Day today, um, which is amazing. So just what a coincidence. <laughs> So on National Mentor Day, anybody out there who's a mentor, thank you very much. And anybody out there who has mentors, perhaps drop them a line and say, it's National Mentors Day. Thank you for being my mentor. Yeah. Right, okay, so on that happy note, I cannot see any more um, hands up or any questions. So I should, draw this to a close really because um, I know that Trung you're lecturing at half past 11 so I'm sure you'd appreciate us finishing a little bit early so you can prepare for your for your lecture but yeah. Trung it's just been as I said before it's been wonderful speaking to you and you've really shared you know a lot about your research and your life and your your future aspirations so that's absolutely great so it's been a delight we didn't know each other beforehand yeah. but I feel like I've known you forever so it's a thank delight you, to get to know you thank and you so thank you all to, so thank you Trung Thank you to all participants for your contribution. Without you, the cafe wouldn't work. So, you know, it's, it's um, lovely to see all 34 people on the line. So the next Academy Cafe will be held on the 10th of December. Um, and this will be a Christmas social. Um, so it'll be less formal than this. And we hope that, um, you know, you're all able to join us and, and there'll be details about that um, in, in the future. Um, but before then, on the 17th of November, we, the Research Committee will be holding our 
research forum. The research forum is an annual event normally held in London where we draw together some of the best researchers and we hear, um, you know, we give awards and we hear, you know, news about um, researchers and we hear about fascinating researchers. Of course, we can't do that this year. So um, it'll be our first ever virtual research forum. So um, if you haven't received an application, please contact the research team, an invitation, please contact the research team because it would be delightful to see you all there. So I look forward to welcoming you in and seeing you all again on the 17th of November. So it just, um, you know, I, all I've got to say now is just Trung again. Thank you very, very much indeed. You know, it's a real Thank pleasure. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Thank you to the Royal Academy of Engineering for all that you do for us to keep you connected. And I'll say goodbye now and thanks everybody and stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.